I should give you a fair warning. Today's topic is the differences between spans of tea and memory of tea, and it's not light, easy bee treating. My goal is not to tell you how awesome they are, they are, it's to get you over the hump and understanding how they work. I'm gonna cover what they do and why. I'm gonna give you some descriptions of the internal workings and tell you a little bit about fast spans and slow spans. Finally, I'll, I'll do my best to describe the owner-consumer model that Memory of Tea uses and why it's relevant when you use these features. So as always, please subscribe to my channel and leave comments with your thoughts and ideas. I'd love to hear from you. If you're interested in seeing how spans can boost the performance of a Dapper repository, visit my blog, betterwithcode.com, and sign up for email notifications. Just check the box labeled Aggregate Mapper so I know that's what you're interested in. All right, back to the main event. The purpose of span of T and memory of T is to provide a way to access contiguous regions of memory in a safe and performant way. They should be used when you want to avoid memory allocations and you want to get great performance. So super quick example here. I'm declaring a string that allocates memory. Next, I use a substring to get the first three characters. That allocates memory for another string. However, if I use the as span method, I can get a span that represents the string and get the first three characters without allocating any memory. The significance of that is that eliminating those memory allocations means that the garbage collector doesn't have to spend time cleaning up that memory. Great, but what's the difference between them? So let's start with describing what a span is. Actually, let's look at some pseudocode. So here's an example of how a span is defined. A span represents a memory region, so it has two properties, a pointer to that memory region and a length to define the size of the span. That's basically it. But how they're defined is actually what's significant. So a span represents stack allocated memory, so it can't appear in the heap. Why? Well, the life of a span could outlast the memory that it wraps. If the underlying memory was garbage collected, we'd have a span that didn't reference what we intended it to. And for that reason, it's defined as a read-only reference struct. What's that? Eh, down the rabbit hole we go. When Microsoft was trying to create spans, they had three problems to overcome. They wanted to avoid synchronization problems between the pointer to the memory and the length of the span in multi-threaded situations. They needed a way to make sure that a span wouldn't be boxed, it wouldn't be stored on the heap, uh, and managed pointers can't be used for fields. To solve this problem, reference structs were created. It's a struct that can only live on the stack. And there's several constraints on this type. It can't implement interfaces. It can't be used as generic type arguments. It can't be boxed. It can't be passed into or used in async methods or iterators. So spans are backwards compatible with versions prior to core 2.1, but you do need C sharp 7.2 or higher to compile them, which is why there's actually two different types of spans. You'd never know it, well, because of compiler magic. So with that, let's talk about the differences between slow spans and fast spans. And we looked at some pseudocode for the definition of a span, which was a fast span. And here's a picture of what that looks like in memory. If we declare a string and we assign it the characters blazing, that string gets allocated on the heap. The address of that object gets put on the stack. And if we create a span to access the data in that string, the span will have a by ref field that points to the string along with a length. We don't actually hold a reference to the actual string object. Slow spans, they're for backwards compatibility. They can't use by ref fields, so they have to be defined a little bit differently. And so here's a picture of what a slow span looks like in memory. The slow span has to include an object reference, the pointer and an offset. The object reference is really important because we don't want the garbage collector to go collect the underlying memory. So holding a reference prevents that from happening. It prevents the garbage collector from reclaiming the memory. And that's the one of the reasons why it's slower is because the span has to calculate where an element in the span is located. And that calculation using the offset, it, it just takes a little bit longer. But don't let that stop you. They're still really fast. So let's switch gears and talk about memory of T. 
Memory of t is used in conjunction with span of t. It has some of the same functionality, like it can get a slice of data that it encompasses, but generally you end up treating it like a box of data that you move from place to place. And when you want to get something out of that box, you're going to call the span operation to get a span. It's kind of like a factory method for spans. The biggest difference between memory of t and span of t is that memory of t is not a biref like type. It's defined with a normal struct. So it can exist on the heap and it doesn't have the limitations or the benefits of span. All right, so here we have a little code sample of how we can use span of t and memory of t. Uh, actually, in this case, we're gonna use read-only memory of t, which is just like memory of t, except it has no setters. Uh, so what I've done here is created a file stream object, a place where we can go ahead and write some bytes to a file. And we're using a buffered writer. We're gonna pass in that file stream and give it a buffer size of, in this case, 128 bytes. And then we'll go ahead and create some text and feed that into our read-only memory of t. And then once we have that, now we can go ahead and call the buffered writer write async method and pass that memory into it. Now the buffered writer class. So here we have our write async method. Now if you remember, memory of t can go on the heap and that's necessary for passing uh, into asynchronous methods and taking it out of asynchronous methods. So that's why we're using read-only memory of t in this case instead of a span of t. If I were to use span of t, it would throw an error and it wouldn't actually compile. Uh, however, we've got another method called write and that does take in a span. And so that's a synchronous function. So when you're using synchronous functions, you can pass in spans. You wanna use spans with synchronous functions. If you're gonna use a asynchronous function, you wanna use memory of t or read-only memory of t. Remember when we talked about the notion that our safe and performant way of accessing memory would get messed up if the underlying data was garbage collected? Well, that becomes a real problem with memory of t. We need a way to manage the lifetime of the object uh, that the memory is pointed at. And to do that, uh, .NET implements a owner and consumer model. So I've actually got a little code sample here to demonstrate how this works. The concept of ownership really means responsibility to dispose of the underlying memory. So when a piece of code is the owner of the memory of T, it's responsible for releasing the memory. The second part of that model is the consumer. The piece of code that holds a reference to the memory is consuming it. So it's the consumer. And what we need is a way to designate which piece of code is the owner. We do that with an instance of iMemoryOwner. So here I'm using a memory pool to rent a section of memory that can store 64 bytes. The rent function returns an instance of iMemoryOwner. And at this point, the main function is the owner of the memory. I can pass this to do something. And at that point, that function becomes the consumer because it has an instance to that memory via the variable buffer. But now let's look at the function do something and own it. The main function is the owner of the memory, but I'm passing an instance of iMemoryOwner into this function, which means I'm passing the responsibility to deallocate the memory. So at this point, once I've passed that iMemoryOwner into the do something and own it, it becomes the owner and the consumer of that memory. As part of a best practices, you really don't want to use an instance of memory of T after you've passed the iMemory of owner into another function. We have to think of it this way. When we call do something and own it, we've given that responsibility to this function and it's likely going to dispose of it. So we wouldn't want to use rental.memory here after we've passed on uh, the iMemory of owner into the function because that memory has probably been disposed of and we don't want to access uh, deallocated memory. All right, I think that's a pretty good foundation for the differences between a span of T and memory of T and a little introduction to the owner-consumer model. Uh, hopefully I've been able to tell you a little bit more about these two features and giving you some ideas about how you could use them in your own projects. Uh, as always, please uh, like the video and subscribe to my channel. It gives me a little bit of feedback on what you're interested in. I love to hear your comments. So thank you very much.